So at the risk of overthinking an internet meme, we're going to talk about the NPC meme, which has definitely broken through into the mainstream over the last couple of days, probably. There's been a BBC article about it, New York Times article about it, social media starting to respond. I think Twitter banned a few accounts. Um, and link it to something that one of our contributors, Jordan Greenhall, has said before. We've put out a few things recently with Jordan Greenhall, and he's definitely one of our favourite thinkers. And he talks about this idea of thinking versus simulated thinking. I think this really helps to kind of identify what's going on and why there's some truth in it and why actually the truth is kind of, the truth effect at the moment it's kind of used to attack the left, but I think it points to something quite fundamental about the way we interact with the world. Um, so to start off by saying what the NPC meme is, I'm not a gamer, you're a gamer, what is it? Yeah, so uh, an NPC in a game is a non-player character. So as, as you're playing a game, you're obviously encountering characters in that game who are computer generated. Um, and they can be quite sophisticated, so you can interact with them and they might have a set of responses. I mean, they do have a set of responses. They are obviously, um, they're running a script. And you might encounter one, go off and do something else, encounter that same NPC later, and they, they just repeat the same thing they said before um, because they don't have free will or agency. And so I guess the joke of the meme and, I, and what the, why the meme has been um, so uh, reacted against so strongly is that it, the suggestion is that people, particularly who are heavily engaged with identity politics, they don't have free will. They're, they are running a script um, and they have stock responses to, to everything. And I think that, that whole idea of um, you have no free will, I think that's the thing that's really gotten under people's skin. Why? Why? Because, I mean, it's absolutely core to being, to your identity. Our identity, our, I think our ego's identity is based in large part around that we are free agents in the world and we're making our own decisions. So I think there's nothing more, um, there's nothing that gets under anyone's skin more than than suggesting that you are you're effectively like part of the matrix. You are running a script. You're not you're not a unique individual. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the matrix because um, Jordan Greenhall appeared in the film Glitch in the Matrix that we we put out um, earlier this year, and that was about the the Jordan Peterson Kathy Newman interview, which I think is the is still the sort of perfect example of of this sort of idea of simulated thinking. Mm -hmm. Because whatever he said, there was a kind of, it was like she was running a computer program. And I think Jordan Greenhall said that after, in, in the Grilich in the Matrix film, there was a kind of input output and it didn't fit. Mm -hmm. He didn't fit into the boxes she was kept, kept trying to ascribe him to, and, but she never actually engaged with what he was saying. Mm -hmm. So that was a really good kind of example of it. But generally, we're going to play a quick clip now from Jordan talking about thinking versus simulated thinking. Simulated thinking, I'm proposing, uh, happens when something breaks down this ability to fluidly participate in both modes. And uh, in fact, maybe even more precisely, is when habit mode shows up as and presents itself as thinking. And this is where it gets very dangerous. Where one is simulated thinking, the individual actually may believe possibly quite earnestly, that they are in fact actually thinking when what they're doing is actually running some kind of script, some kind of habit. Um, and, and of course, oftentimes, some kind of script that was not necessarily even theirs in the first place. They're running a, uh, a third party script, um, malware, as it were. So the key point in this isn't just that there are two forms of thinking, one is habit mode and one is explore mode. It's that Sometimes habit mode is the right way to, to interact with the world. Often it is. And explore mode is laborious, it takes time, it's not useful. The problem with simulated thinking is when the wrong method is used, when habit mode is used, when explore mode is required. And that's usually when the situation has changed, especially when the culture has changed, which we would argue it has. Mm. And the, the methods that have been used up until now in the culture especially as kind of defense strategy from a lot of people on the left of accusing other people of being bigoted, sexist, racist, when they get onto topics that they don't like, is no longer functioning. And I think that's the really interesting part, is that simulated thinking, 
works well when, when the environment is not changing. The environment is clearly changing very significantly, especially if you're on, on the left and you've been hit by Brexit, you've been hit by Trump. Really, and we've said this quite a few times, it's like if you, if you haven't started kind of questioning some of how the way that you're acting in the world has, has contributed to these things that you were not expecting and not wanting to happen, then what will it take for you to kind of think of, we've talked about the shadow of liberalism, which is this sort of tribalism that doesn't want to admit that it's a tribalism. And also kind of amygdala hijacking, which is an interesting idea as well, which is, you know, the amygdala is this part of the brain, very old part of the brain, which is really involved in our fight or flight response and just can take us over because it's based on our survival. So anything that threatens our identity or like our tribal identity as well, the amygdala can come in and we're ready to fight or run away. And actually like our pupils get bigger and our blood goes to our limbs and we're just completely charged up. Impossible to have real thinking in that mode. You can't. When your sympathetic nervous system is going crazy, you can't think straight. Like, and we are all prone to it. Um, I get into that mode sometimes when I get really angry on Facebook. Or t tends to be online actually, which is the interesting thing. Um, yeah, and so and then this this idea I think Brett Weinstein talked about around it, it's pretty like it's pretty terrifying for us on a deep level biologically to say something that goes against the tribe. And I want like this kind of simulated thinking is in large part, I think, a way to make sure that you stick with the tribe. Because going against the tribe in the past would have been an existential threat. Yeah. Like falling out with your tribe, and that's sort of deep rooted into us, is that it, it, if you fell out with your tribe in any way, that was probably the end of you. Yeah. Um, so, and I think Brett said this again, is that we have to be able to evolve past the tools we've been given by evolution if we're going to survive. Because the old programs that we're running are not fit for the modern world and are probably, well, not even probably, I think he says definitely self-destructive. So I find this really interesting. Like if we're in a debate mode, kind of the implicit frame is that I'm trying to, to beat you. So we're gonna play another clip from Jordan Greenhall. A debate, what we normally uh, do is very much in the, in the direction of a habit mode and as a consequence, can quite often fall into simulated thinking. You know, a, de a debater is engaging in a pattern recognition and rapid response activity with perhaps a, a specific uh, small amount of uh, focused thinking controlling the structure. I think we should be clear that the primary utility is investing someone in a uh, social conversation um, and that isn't at all conducive to collaborative thinking. So that what ends up happening is that when someone shows up who's actually trying to engage in collaborative thinking and someone else deploys the toolkit of uh, debate, um, the debater will show up as winning, at least to those who aren't watching closely. Um, and the thinker will show up as being um, oftentimes really rather stupid. And so, you know, nobody wants to emulate that. And so what ends up happening is that it begins to select against thinking in both directions, which is to say people who are trying to think lose and other people don't even try because it just looks like a bad choice. Um, and this shows up all over the place. You know, the political infighting is of this sort. What he's saying is that the strategies that are selected for in that environment are kind of running a script. It's running good strategy. It's running if this, then this. Mm -hmm. And then in that frame, simulated thinking starts being selected for. When you say this, I know that I can respond with this, and that will win the, the, the debate. Mm. We're not in a place of exploring the question. And if someone shows up who's actually trying to explore the question, to think in public, then that person will look like a moron mm. because they're not, they're not playing the same game. But then that environment starts to select against genuine thinking. And that has been happening for an awfully long time, which, is, which ties into the whole intellectual dark web concept because the intellectual dark web, if it's anything, is the idea that we can think in public. And I guess part of it comes from the trust that they have of going on each other's shows and knowing each other, and then they're able to explore ideas knowing that no one's gonna try and catch them out um, or kind of throw insults at them and say, well, talking about gender differences between men and women, you're, you're sexist or whatever. Um, but I think that's really, really interesting because I think that same process has happened in many different industries. What Eric Weinstein calls the gated institutional narrative, 
which is a sort of, sort of self-protection thing yeah. where genuinely novel thinking is starts to be selected against and starts to be a losing strategy for people in these in institutions. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's also... Um, what's been interesting to watch is this kind of accusation that the NPC meme is dehumanizing because implicit in the ability to have a, a, you know, a conversation, a collaborative conversation, is the idea that we meet each other with a certain level of human to human respect, even if we disagree. Um, and there's been a lot of pushback from um, you know, those spreading the meme saying, well, we were dehumanized, we got accused of being Russian bots. And it's like, yeah, I can see that. We all dehumanize each other all the time. Uh, it's happening on both sides. And it, it's part of, um, it happens as well. I mean, we even do it in workshops. That's what we tell people to look for when trying to find the, the shadow, the, one of their shadows. You know, we all have many shadows. It's where do we feel like total contempt, where we think this person is less than human. Um, and it's happening constantly. And that is something that if we are going to actually get into a place where we can have these collaborative conversations, while still disagreeing with one another, it's essential that we come from a place of recognizing shared humanity at the very least. Like that's kind of a, a baseline because otherwise um, uh, we're kind of screwed. It, it doesn't go anywhere. It can't go anywhere. It's, you know, it just gets further and further into um, the other is not human, but I am. This is another concept that Jordan Greenhall talks about, that what we need to create is collective intelligences. Mm -hmm that no one of us will be able to come up with the idea, so we need to, to generate a collective intelligence. And the only way of doing that is through collaborative thinking, is through, I think this, you taking what I'm saying and then building on it and building on it and building on it in this generative way. And if we're, if we're playing the same rivalrous, divisive, trying to beat each other, which mm. kind of any YouTube comments thread or any kind of Facebook argument, then what we're doing, you can win that game, but then you're just winning, you're winning a game of quoits on the Titanic as the ship is sinking. Mm. And I think that's true on a, on a kind of interpersonal level, um, something that Jordan Peterson talks about. Well, yeah, you can, you can dominate your wife if you want to, if you want to kind of win an argument. What does winning an argument mean in a relationship? Well, it probably means not winning, being right, and then them resenting you for the next 20 years. It, it means how do you win in a way that keeps the health of the system? And that's what I think he was also pointing to with his, inter, his um, interjection about Kavanaugh, was how do we have an outcome that, it, that works for the health of the system rather than working just for one side beating the other? Again, maybe that wasn't appropriate, people have their different views on that, but I think that was the context that he was coming from, of how do you have an outcome from this that, that um, doesn't add to the already kind of existential threats of, of polarization and partisanship that we've got in the system already. Yeah, and I think it, that brings up something that I think is maybe like a common theme of what we're talking about right here, which is it's, it's about how we think, not what we think. Like we're very focused on what people think. Uh, and so much of this is, uh, so much progress is going to be around how we think. Um, and then also where we think, in a way, because I notice, like, I really struggle with that kind of dehumanizing of the other online, especially. You know, I really, I have to, <laughs> to prevent myself typing comments. I have to, you know, I notice it happening in myself. I notice the kind of righteous anger. Um, I don't really get it in person. I mean, I can meet the same person in person and have a completely different, like, oh, yeah, man, I dis disagree with them, but they're, they're so yeah. she's cool, he's cool, you know, and just get, get into a place that's almost immediately much more collaborative because it's human to human. Um, and so, yeah, how and where we think, I think that's, you know, part of the next frontier. So we're going to put some of the clips that we've talked about, uh, including the Jordan Greenhall one in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this and you want to get early access to some other great films, please consider becoming a patron and see you soon.